See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. We need your passion. We need your care. We need your energy. We need your stamina. We need everything that you have to solve the problems of the world. I tell trainees that their passion, their enthusiasm sustain me in what I do. To build the health system that all of us wish we worked in. That's where I think we need a revolution. Let's dig a little bit deeper in the solutions. An investment in nursing is an investment in humanity. Hey, See You Now listeners, Shauna Butler here. As we say goodbye to summer and our adventures on the road, meeting new ideas and people, leading crucial conversations about healthcare, and sharing what clinicians, patients, and the public experience in a wide range of healthcare encounters, we bring you the final installment of our experience at the Aspen Ideas Health Conference held in the stunning summer mountains of Aspen, Colorado. Aspen Ideas Health is known and appreciated for bringing together a wide range of experts, activists, policymakers, community leaders, artists, and scientists for stimulating and sometimes provocative discussions and conversations. In Aspen's 60 plus sessions, the conversations both on and off the stage were designed to engage a broad audience in the issues that shape our lives, challenge our times, and introduce us to leaders and ideas that chart pathways towards better help for all. Building on the recognition that reliable, safe, quality healthcare for all depends significantly on a well-trained, energetic, and abundant workforce, the health and well-being of clinicians took center stage at Aspen. Despite schools of nursing, medicine, and public health currently attracting record numbers of qualified applicants, many highly trained health professionals are fleeing the field. Given the vital nature of healthcare careers to our personal and collective health, understanding how best to attract, support, and reward our healthcare workforce is urgent. We're pleased to share this lively panel discussion led by physician and former New York City Health Commissioner Dave Choksi, speaking candidly with seasoned clinicians representing a wide range of clinical experience about the exhaustion, debt, and moral injury plaguing the healthcare workforce, the political, financial, and workforce solutions they advocate for, and in spite of, or because of, the numerous system-level challenges, why working in healthcare remains a rewarding and promising career choice. I have uh, the distinct privilege of getting to introduce our speakers for this wonderful session. It's hard to think about a topic that is more important or fundamental to everything else that we're talking about during Aspen Ideas Health. Because without health workers, there is no health care and there is no health system. We have people who have not just thought about this, they have lived it in so many ways. So it's my privilege to get to introduce them. First is Dr. Adrian Billings. Adrian is a rural family medicine physician. That means he takes care of patients across all ages of life, from childhood to, to old age. Uh, he does it in a clinic, in a hospital, and he does it in some extraordinary circumstances. Uh, he practices in West Texas, close to the uh, Texas and Mexico border. Next to Adrian is Dr. Sandra Lindsay. Sandra is a critical care nurse and a nurse leader at Northwell Health. She's a fellow New Yorker, like I am, and she bears the distinction of having been the first person in the United States to have received the COVID-19 vaccine. And next to Sandra is Dr. Shaban Westcott. 
Shaban is a professor and the director of American Indian Health at the University of Nebraska. She is a fierce advocate for health equity, and particularly for the health of Native Americans, stemming from her Alaska Native roots. So welcome to all of the speakers. Uh, briefly, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dave Choksi. I had the honor of serving as New York City's health commissioner until March of this year, and I'm a primary care doctor at Bellevue Hospital. We are going to keep this session lively and interesting, and we're going to get to your questions as well. So let me just dive right in with my first question, uh, which is for Siobhan. Okay. We're going to get into the pandemic uh, a little bit later and, and what comes next. But as we know, the truth is that health workers have been sending out an SOS signal for, for years, if not decades. There was an article in STAT in 2018 which termed one of the fundamental causes of this moral injury, mm -hmm. moral injury. The authors defined it simply as being unable to provide healing in the context of healthcare and pointed to our broken administrative payment and technological systems as the sources of that injury. So to start, how much of what we're experiencing right now during the pandemic and afterward is actually because of those broken systems from long before? I would say 95%. It's a very broken system, and I will start taking aim right away. By the way, in case you haven't already guessed, my pronouns are she, her, badass. Uh, <laughs> those, were, those were given to me. But if you've ever tried to use an electronic health record, you will appreciate this data ranking digital programs, it was the only one that was an F. An A was for Google search, and GPS was in the middle of a C. But these were designed by billers, they were not designed by healers, and it shows. And the amount of work that doctors and nurses have to do in order to keep up with records, that's where there's an issue because you get paid for visits. That's where I think we need a revolution in billing in that you're not billing just for visits or procedures, but you're billing for interactions with the patients because that's what you've got to have long term, you've got to have healing interactions, and sometimes that's a message on your one chart. So that is um, one of the ways that we really need to improve things. I understand it makes things easier. And I was at that bridge where I would still order paper charts. You know, you had to wait for it to come up from the storage room. I've seen both worlds, and this digital world has failed the healthcare system, and it's failing the healthcare workers. I think an important point in that is that even when we talk about administrative hurdles or technological or the reimbursement hurdles, they're all tied together, and we'll try to disentangle some of that. Adrian or Sandra, anything else that you want to share in terms of the experience before COVID-19 that has reverberated today? Yeah, just to add to Siobhan's assessment of the electronic health record, we thought as nurses it was going to make our lives easier, but it's actually taken us away from the patient. We need to get closer to the patient. That's how we impact and influence care and can practice the art and the science of nursing. And we feel like we are healing, basically, the technology and not our patients. I would agree. You know, it makes me think of one of the airports that we traveled through to get here. Um, I saw a quote from Coretta Scott King, and, and I'm going to slaughter the quote, so don't hold me to this, but maybe look it up. But it was something to the point, the measure of a society's good is their efforts to create empathetic actions, mm -hmm. not just empathy. We, we hope that all of us that go into healthcare, we have empathy, that we arrive to our healthcare training with some sort of ingrained empathy that either was innate or we've learned from the nurturers in our life. And I certainly think that the electronic health records make it very difficult because we're spending over 50% of our patient in encounters, for the most part, doctoring or nursing the electronic health record rather than trying to show empathetic actions towards the patient who is seated across from us. So bringing it forward to uh, the experience that all of us had during COVID-19, 
Uh, and Sandra, I'd like to start with you. Um, you know, one of the memories that I have from the pandemic, I was actually sitting down with the head of the nurses union in New York. I was trying to enlist her help in our vaccination campaign, including in getting more nurses vaccinated because as you well know, not all nurses were quite as ready to get vaccinated as you were. And the thing that she was imparting to me was the profound loss of trust uh, that so many nurses felt, particularly during that devastating first wave in New York City where there were failures with respect to PPE and there were failures with respect to not protecting and looking after nurses. So. Can you share a little bit about your experience during COVID-19? Sure, so before I get into my experience, I'd just like to say thank you to all healthcare workers, my nurses who worked tirelessly during the first wave and continue to show up today despite the exhaustion and the tremendous pressures and stress that we are under. And thank you to our allies and supporters who have always been there with us and continue to be there with us. So my experience on March 7th is when I remember we got our first patient into the intensive care unit at the organization where I work. And by March 13th, I was meeting with my team to say, this is not looking good. We need to expand ICU capacity, and we need to be at work on Saturday, March 14, 2020, to make that happen. So we met at work on the 14th, opened up 12 more ICU beds in addition to the 48 which we had, and by Monday, March 16, it was a different place. Mm -hmm. It was volumes and volumes of patients just coming into the doors gasping for air. It was hard to watch. And we were just running. It was heels off, clogs on, scrubs on, they're still on, no more heels. And we're just running to save lives. And for a leader who my team has always looked to me for answers, I didn't have answers for them. But I was very transparent, so I wouldn't lose their trust. And I worked side by side with them. Thankfully, our organization took the threat of COVID-19 seriously and prepared by having personal protective equipment for us. So we never run out of personal protective equipment at Northwell Health. But it was disappointing to see that my colleagues close by in city hospitals were running into the fire, the burning building without proper protection. And that was really heart-wrenching for us. We felt the guilt, we felt the pain that they were feeling. And it's a position that we never want to be in again. And so equity across all our hospitals in every part of the United States and around the world is very, very, very important. They were long days, they were sleepless nights, um, nothing in my educational preparation to be a nurse. I also went to business school and most recently received my doctorate in health sciences could have prepared me mm -hmm. for what we went through. Thank you for, for sharing those stories and, mm -hmm. uh, and that vulnerability. Um, I, I wanna go from, from the experience in New York City, the urban context, to what COVID-19 was like in the rural context and turn to you, uh, to you, Adrian, as well. You have shared some harrowing stories, you know, with the rest of us uh, before this session, but give us a glimpse into what it was like in that same moment that people were learning about this very rapid rise in cases and really wrapping our minds around what COVID-19 meant. Um, for a rural health system that has less resources to start with, what did that feel like for you? Yeah, thank you. And, and first, I do also still also want to say thank you for allowing me to give the rural perspective and to advocate for rural healthcare systems. And to the healthcare students in the audience, 
and I know we have at least one because my, my <laughs> oldest son, uh, Blake, is in the third row here, and he's a uh, public health major at the University of Texas. Um, I, <laughs> I would go back to medical school all over again, despite all the challenges that we are eliciting. You are needed, and I just want to you know, make that true that, that I would do this all over again. I tell all of my trainees that because of the level of burnout that we have. But, you know, the rural healthcare organizations, one is um, rural healthcare organizations, whether they be critical access hospitals like I practice out of, a 25 bed hospital with no intensive care unit, or it be a rural federally qualified health center where I do my ambulatory care at. They are like, I, I tell this to policymakers and legislators when I testify, they're like small football teams or small soccer teams, and that the bench often is empty or it has very few on it compared to a larger urban organization. And so when somebody gets sick or somebody quits or somebody moves on, there may not be anybody to pull from the bench back into the game. Uh, and, and game is not the right word when we're talking about caring for somebody's life. But on July 5th, 2021, this acute on chronic workforce shortage really hit us in the Big Bend region of West Texas, which is one of the most uh, medically underserved areas in the, in the United States. And we, I've been practicing there my entire career of 16 years, and we've never had to shut down a service line within the hospital. We always were short, but there was always somebody on the bench that we could pull in. And with the pandemic, and with what happened with the burnout and um, rural healthcare organizations tend to not pay very well. And so you can't blame um, healthcare providers for wanting to do better for their family and going to higher needs area, predominantly in urban areas when we had these pop-up hospitals. And so on July 5th, 2021, we knew that our labor and delivery unit was staffed very lean with our labor and delivery nurses. And I'm a family physician that still delivers babies. But we got a call, um, myself and my three family physician colleagues, we got a call from the chief nursing officer that effective immediately, our labor and delivery unit would be on diversion. Mm -hmm. And that means essentially closed. And so, you know, that's not a big deal if you're perhaps in an urban area and you can go a block or half a mile or a mile to the next labor and delivery unit. But this critical access hospital in Alpine serves about a 12,000 square mile area from Van Horn, Texas to Del Rio, Texas, all the way down to the Mexican border. And we capture and service about a 25,000 population within that 12,000 square mile area. So when we went on diversion, that meant that we could not deliver babies with labor and delivery nurses in the labor and delivery unit. And so we had to transfer them from Alpine, 160 miles away to Midland or Odessa. And we don't have any ground EMS that can take patients and transfer. We, we're lucky to have EMS units and there's not ground. So that's a $50,000 airplane ride when we can get them to come to our facility to transfer a laboring patient out. And if, if they're too far advanced in labor, then we have to deliver them in the emergency room with emergency room nurses who are not trained labor and delivery nurses. It's a very specific skill set that labor and delivery nurses have. And so I, I can tell you for certain that these laboring women that deliver in an emergency room, we are not able to provide the standard of care that these women deserve. And once the woman delivers, we then have to make the decision, do we fly the most part of mother and the baby that 160 miles to Odessa because we cannot hold on to them because our med surge nurses also don't have that skill set to take care of a newborn baby and a postpartum a mother. But unfortunately, most of the patients make the very difficult decision, I'm just going to go home and not receive that standard of care of at least staying 24 hours in the hospital. So, um, Siobhan, you know, I, I know much of what Adrian is describing mm -hmm. resonates with, mm -hmm. with you and your experience uh, in a tragic way. I want to bring in one other element to the conversation here uh, from your experience, and I do this as the, the former head of a local health department as well. The title of this session is Why Work in Healthcare? But 
we should also be talking about public health mm -hmm. and public health workers. There are about 300,000 public health workers across the United States, particularly in state and local health departments, and they have also felt the brunt of the pandemic. So how should we think about the impacts on the public health workforce mm -hmm. and where we need to go with respect to shoring up a workforce that has been disinvested in and decimated over years? Well, first I have to acknowledge what Adrian said because for a lot of people, the pandemic significantly impacted their lives, but for healthcare, it was war. And just last week, the American Medical Association launched the Physician Recovery Plan from war, essentially. And, and his story is from a little known genre called um, healthcare horror, my favorite of which is neutropenic on a plane. Some of you will get that. Yes. It's very bad, <laughs> very bad. But for the public health workers, I think it's all intertwined because you need to work with the healthcare systems and the healthcare staff to have a coordinated plan. And when they're trying to triage people in tents or turning parking garages into hospital beds, uh, housing, you can't interact with them. So it's, it's even harder when it, everybody was stretched so thin. And public health has really been underinvested in and not established well enough. And you could really see in states at the time the pandemic hit, it was in North Dakota, or as we called it, North Dakota. We did not um, have enough infrastructure for public health to reach out. So there's just so much that needs to be done, but I think we have to take, especially the early part of the pandemic as you know, sheer crisis and how we recover from that now, I think is, is gonna be really tough, but there's been an uptick in both med students, I'm sure nurse, nursing students and public health students at the graduate level. So. I feel like the kids are gonna save us. And one great story, and I, I won't give too many details because it's not my story to tell, but some med students figured out that there were factory workers in Mexico making PPE and they could not get vaccinated in Mexico and they could not cross the border and vaccinate them. So they set up a system and they vaccinated 2,400 workers by having them walk up to the border and then from the other side, they reached over and put the vaccine in their arm. So. The kids are gonna save us, is what I'm saying. And part of, it's all intertwined in a way as well because I feel like physicians, nurses, and other key people in healthcare, which let's face it, everybody is key in healthcare, because they're fighting with the electronic medical record or for reimbursement, they're not able to have that same creativity that the med students are showing because they have a little extra time. So I think that's just something that we should consider when we when we think about what next. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper in the solutions. We've heard the scale and the scope of the problem. We've heard how it is entrenched and it has its roots from before COVID, but also the ways in which the pandemic has exacerbated so much of it. And you know, one of the things that always motivates and inspires me is what you were just talking about, Shaban, for us to build the health system that all of us wish we worked in but more importantly, the responsibility of our generation to build it for your son, Adrian, and all of those other idealistic students who are coming up so that they can channel their idealism toward actually taking care of people rather than fighting the electronic health record or trying to get you know, basic funding. But I have to say, when we think about the solutions that are being discussed right now, whether it's marginal increases in funding or trying to change the way some health systems are thinking about well-being and wellness, they feel too superficial. They feel like they're not matched to the scale and the scope that we just talked about. So we're at the Aspen Ideas Festival. This is our chance to suspend disbelief. What are those bigger, bolder changes that we ought to be calling for in our health system? And because nurses are the linchpin of this and we're facing such a staffing crisis with nurses, maybe Sandra, I'll ask you to start. Sure, so just exactly what you said, Dr. Chosky, nursing is the backbone of any health system. We make up the largest healthcare provider group and so a health system 
without nurses is just impossible. So what do we need for nurses? COVID has decimated, as you heard from Siobhan and Adrian, health systems across the nation, and we need to replenish that. But first, we need to make it attractive for people to want to come into nursing. And I do agree, Siobhan, that it's our young people that's going to save us. Despite the challenges, it's still a rewarding field to get into, to be able to impact someone's life, someone's family life, a whole generation is incredibly rewarding. It is predicted that by 2030, this was in 2017, this prediction was made that approximately a million nurses would leave the profession. COVID exacerbated that and those numbers are off the charts now. So we need to make investment in nursing and investment across all ethnic groups mm -hmm. so that we can serve all populations better and provide equity in care. So we need to have a pipeline for young folks who want to come into the profession, make it easier for them to come into the profession in terms of the cost. Have a pipeline for where nurse in attendance can work and work towards becoming a registered nurse. We need to invest in nursing education for existing nurses to thrive and grow and develop to meet the needs of our populations. We need to invest in nursing schools, more space in nursing faculty so that our nursing faculty can provide the education that the nurses need. We need to retain the current nurses and not have brain drain where when you have a flood of nurses that come into the space that we have no one to train them. We need to invest in the health and well-being of our nurses. We are broken. Mm -hmm. We are broken, in case you didn't know that. We are very, very broken. And, you know, as nurses, we're so used to helping that sometimes we don't show our vulnerability and ask for help, but we are broken. And so to get us to stay, we need investment. We need equitable investments so that our rural nurses aren't suffering mm -hmm. and the urban nurses are just gaining the benefits of those investments because they live in cities that can afford to invest heavily. We need equity across the nation in nursing investment. It's a bold vision for the future of nursing. Adrian and then Siobhan. Sure, I, I'll echo that, Sandra. That was very well said. I think we all recognize that healthcare in our country is a privilege. It's, it's not a right. And it doesn't matter. I'm old enough to remember that when you had health insurance, that almost absolutely guaranteed you access to care and access to care that you could afford. And I'm wearing my school board uh, member hat right now. Many of our teachers in our school, they cannot afford the co-pays because of their low salary, their inequitable salary and unjust salary. We need to move this country towards moving it to that healthcare is, is a right for us mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be that it's a privilege. And I really think that the root cause of that is getting back to, I asked my trainees and I'm gonna pose this question to the audience here and I'll make it a little bit easier. Who do you think has the most effect in the hospital or in the exam room? Is it the nurse or the physician? Or is it the politician? <laughs> it's the policymaker who decides whether or not to expand Medicaid. My state is one of 11 or 14 states in the country that has not expanded Medicaid. So that absolutely closes the door. Many of my low income patients that deserve care and need to be taken care of. And so I think really the root cause is I was thinking at an event yesterday, each of us won, we have to vote. But I think we have to be running for office. I think we, we, and, and, and beyond that of a school board member, you know, we have to be running for state and national office so that we are the ones setting the policy. We are the ones who know about scientific integrity. I would pose, I think that we have some more empathy than perhaps some of our, our politicians. And so I think that, you know, really the, the root cause is that we, we have to be putting ourselves out there and running and setting the policies. Thank you. Shabbat. Okay. Well, 
we have one point of tension in this panel, and it's that there is one group in the U.S. with a birthright to health care, and it is members of federally recognized tribes. But if you look at the data, their health is amongst the worst in our country. So part of the problem, and this is pre-pandemic, the rate of physician vacancies in the Indian Health Service is 20 to 25 percent. Imagine trying to do your work without a fifth or a quarter of the doctors that you need. And that's all wrapped up in also a lot of those areas are rural. So it's just hard to get providers into rural areas. But I think my biggest point, and if nobody remembers anything else from this talk, please let it be this, that we need a paradigm shift that visits in person or even telemedicine is not the only way that there is healthcare delivered. And that messages and other interactions, phone calls with patients needs to be valued so that physicians aren't just trying to keep the lights on and their clinic open, but also give the care that people need. So that would be my takeaway. Thank you so much, Siobhan. We're going to spend the last 10 minutes taking your questions, but before we get to that, I want to do a couple of lightning rounds. So question for, uh, for all of our panelists, but your answers have to be 30 seconds or less. So, um, so let's start with this one, which I think flows from those bigger solutions that you've already alluded to. Let's say you are in the Oval Office with President Biden and you have this limited window to convey what you think needs to change around how we think about health workers and what the future should look like for them. So Adrian, why don't you kick us sure, off? Sure, 30 seconds, okay. So <clears throat> we have to have a healthcare workforce that is culturally competent and reflective of our nation. Rural students are an underrepresented population in healthcare training programs. We need to be prioritizing and optimizing a certain portion of nursing schools, medical schools, all the multidisciplinary healthcare training programs for our rural students that are disadvantaged academically because of underfunded public rural uh, schools. We have to expand the rural health workforce that's multidisciplinary from the community health worker mm -hmm. to the nurse, to the physician, to the behavioral health worker, to the social worker. Thank you. Sandra, I think you may have met President Biden. I think you were at the State of the Union. So um, what did you yeah. tell him or, or what would you like to do? I, I told him that uh, we need to expand the nursing workforce to meet the needs of our population. We need to invest heavily in nurses that, are, that have stayed in the profession and that an investment in nursing is worthwhile, an investment that he'll get maximum return on in on his investment, and an investment in nursing is an investment in humanity. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> well, I would keep it very simple, because sometimes with policymakers uh, who have 100,000 things that they're saying, you just, you have one ask. So mine would be fully fund the Indian Health Service Scholarship. Every year they turn down medical students who qualify, often who are native, and are more likely to go back to their community or serve a native community and they can't get funded through the Indian Health Service. So that would be my one ask. Thank you. Um, now turning from, from the United States President to uh, the folks who really matter. The, <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> the, the students who are coming up, the health workers of tomorrow. If you had 30 seconds to tell them why you love what you get to do despite all of the challenges and problems, and perhaps in some cases because of those challenges, what would you reach for to try to inspire them? And Shaban, maybe you can get us started. Well, I would say I love what I do because healing does happen person to person in a healthcare setting, but when you have bad policies, uh, you can't fix it with a person to person visit public health really is incredibly important, especially the policy side of thing. I agree, that's one of the most important players when we're talking about ending health inequities and bringing in, I, I like the definition of health equity is optimal health for all. 
Sandra. So um, I would say to our youngsters that I see how much you care, the passion you have to solve the problems of the world, hunger, climate change. Well, health is one of those problems. We need your passion, we need your care, we need your energy, we need your stamina, we need everything that you have to join us in this fight to heal the nation and provide a stable healthcare system. Adrian. I tell trainees that their passion, their enthusiasm sustain me <laughs> in what I do. And I tell them, find your calling. Don't think about the paycheck. Don't choose, with regards to medical students, don't choose the, the, the specialty that pays you the most money if your heart is not in it. Mm -hmm. Find your calling. I really view healthcare workers from the front office receptionist to everybody up and in between that that's delivering care as missionaries. And that's just a, an amazing profession to have, to work as a missionary and caring for others who may not have access to health care, would it not be for you and your team of the multidisciplinary health care team that we need to fully take care of patients? Thanks to each of you. And uh, you know, I'll, just, um, I'll just add briefly, inspired by your responses, actually, that uh, there are so few professions that exist where you can both take care of someone, you can bear witness to their struggle and their suffering and use that and sublimate it into the change that we need in our world, whether it's via policy or whether it's uh, building a better health system for, um, for the people that we serve, most importantly, uh, but for all of our colleagues as well. Um, so with that, let's turn to some Q&A from the audience. We'll start oh. on the left-hand side and get to as many as we can. So gentlemen in the front row here. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Ewomar Valdry. I'm a medical student at Mayo Clinic and a, uh, an Aspen Health Fellow. I'm here with my wonderful fiance, uh, who's also a health fellow and a medical student at U of A Phoenix. And what we've actually done is create this program that's the Robin Hood of PPE, where we've collected over 500,000 uh, medical supplies that are unused and reallocate them, redistribute them to uh, safety net clinics and people who really need those in vulnerable communities. What we've seen is that those institutions with a high, a high population of Medicaid patients actually have worse access to PPE. So what can we do to address equitable access to PPE for the healthcare workers that, that really need it? Thank you. Sure, I'll take that. I think, you know, an ally, part of our healthcare team, I've begun to realize that our healthcare team includes journalists that, that advocate and are our bullhorn, but also the, the Medicaid insurers. And so I don't know if you've already reached out to the Medicaid insurers. Amerigroup is one of our big Medicaid payer in Texas, and they recently donated a um, manufactured home for us to host uh, trainees and rotating clinicians in one of our most isolated clinics down on the Texas-Mexico border. So they've been a wonderful ally. Okay, we can move to the next question. Hi everyone, Marco, University of Michigan Medical School, also a health fellow. So question, I'm hearing a lot about this, you know, burnout and stress with trained professionals, nurses, doctors, and then I'm hearing this big contrast to, you know, medical students that we have this creativity, this ambition, this drive to kind of make this change. And now I'm like thinking about the in-between. So residency, you know, outstanding debt, high like hours of work, low wage. What do you think could be done at this stage, like throughout training to, you know, to kind of keep this creativity and this ambition alive, which I would argue that often could suck it out. I'll take Chip that up. one. So I went to Harvard Med School, which I summarized as saying I was belittled by the best. <laughs> <laughs> There's a toxic culture in medicine, he, he, Adrian knows, um, that I think, you know, with, honestly, I'll say with, now that it's more women than men entering med school, hopefully some of that will turn around. Uh, but it, there's, there's a hierarchy and there's hazing, uh, specialties vary in how much that happens. But it's also just the sheer hours uh, that wear people down. And so, like, these first questions and the first folks we have, it's all med students, guys. I want you to recognize that the kids are trying to save us. And everybody else is dealing with things that they shouldn't have to deal with. So I think that's the beauty of a panel like this at Aspen Health Ideas to say, 
let's think bigger and fix some of those pressures that are really beating out the ambition and ideas from our young people. Because, you know, Adrian and I started out in medicine very enthusiastic, as I'm sure as med students I can tell, and the system beats you down. I would also say that it's some of the same solutions we need for, for nurses, where we're helping to manage those secondary stressors. You mentioned debt from student loans, the high cost of childcare, elder care, just everything outside of work in the hospital that wears you down, that wears on your mind, that people come to work with and cannot then give the best quality care that they know how to give. So I agree with you that we need some strategies to address those issues as well. Can I just add one point on this thread? Because I think it's such an important one, and, and I appreciate the question. You know, very often when we talk about solutions, we are more willing to talk about what someone else should be doing. The, the policymaker should be doing this. You know, the funder should be doing that. And a lot of what we've talked about in, in this, at least, when it comes to the organization of nursing and medicine, our training programs, the locus of control is is with us. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of this is about turning the spotlight inward and saying, what is it that we need to do differently, that we need to shift, um, because that is our responsibility to do so for, um, for the folks who are asking the questions. Uh, let's move over on this side, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Wales. I'm a physician from California and very involved in organized medicine nationally and, and statewide. And what we haven't talked about is our mental health, you know, uh, just how devastating it is. And this pre certainly predates COVID, mm -hmm. but I'd love to hear your comments about any ideas you have on increasing the workforce at all the levels, physicians, uh, you know, social workers, you know, psychological assistants, all of that. Uh, to help our crisis that we're experiencing now in healthcare with mental health. Yeah, and I will give a quick, quick anecdote. I was just recently on a call where we were trying to understand some data, and literally the definition of burnout, a lot of people didn't, who are in medicine didn't consider themselves burnt out unless they were feeling suicidal. Physicians, med students, we're in. We're like, yes, let's do it. And we, the, the only point at which they said, like, if I'm suicidal, well, then maybe I need to leave. So, you know, I feel like there's so many people wanting to go into medicine now. The, the sheer number of applicants to med schools is, is continuing to rise in the pandemic. And what we need to do is look at how we can be more supportive. I think finances is a big deal because especially a lot of the folks who need the most care come from under-resourced communities where you don't have a lot of capacity to absorb all of the thousands and thousands of extra costs that come from being a med student. And I'm sure the same is true for nursing. It's just difficult. So you're already creating inequities in just who can even contemplate that career. I think we have a moonshot opportunity to, to expand the um, healthcare workforce right now by both our state and federal governments and our commercial payers working together in a public-private partnership um, to, to increase pipeline programs and to, to get those underrepresented uh, students that we need in, in healthcare so that our healthcare workforce nationally reflects our, our national population. We have time for one last question, please. Hi, I'm Gail. I'm the chief nurse at Houston Methodist, so good to see fellow Texans. You didn't mention at all the nurses working to the highest level of their licensure. And I know at Houston Methodist, we're really, as a spotlight is on nursing, to really look um, at biotech to help us to do that with voice-activated charting, surveillance in rooms that when we turn a patient, it will automatically chart for us. So I was wondering if there's any of that nationally that you could look towards to help nurses to advocate for more tech work and let us do what we know what to do. I love those ideas. Nurses have long been saying just the amount of paperwork and 
administrative work and non-nursing work that nurses have to do really takes away from the patients. And I agree that using some technology that actually helps and not hinders, having scribes and more assistive personnel like some physicians do would greatly, greatly help us to be at the bedside and really um, impacting care at the bedside with our patients, which is what they need. And those scribes are like the pipeline, or the pathway, as I like to call it, because mm -hmm. pipelines leak. Uh, because it, then they're seeing one-on-one -on -one what's happening and uh, really decide if it's, if it's what they want. Because often it is. But you've got to try it. Absolutely. So we need to think differently, look at every profession in our healthcare organization differently, perhaps reorganize the roles of some of our techs, even our unit receptionists. Every single person, I think we need to look at their jobs differently and how we can best utilize them to care best for our patients. Siobhan, Sandra, and Adrian, thank you foremost for what you did for your communities and for our nation during an extraordinarily difficult time uh, for all of us. And thank you for this wonderful panel. Please join me. A huge thanks to the panelists, critical care nurse Sandra Lindsay, rural family care physician Adrian Billings, and public health physician and advocate for Native Americans, Shabon Westcott, and to physician Dave Choksi for leading this eye-opening conversation. To watch this and all the Aspen Idea Health sessions, check out our show notes at seeyounowpodcast.com for links to the videos. As revealed in this conversation, our healthcare workforce is in urgent need of relief and replenishment, practical support, system-level solutions and action, and significant financial investment to design and build a safer, healthier workplace where our workforce can thrive and flourish. When speaking to the newest and aspiring generations of our healthcare workforce, Sandra nailed it when she said, we need your passion. We need your care. We need your energy. We need your stamina. We need everything you have to join us in this fight to heal this nation and provide a stable healthcare system. An investment in nursing is an investment in humanity. Amen. It's been a busy summer filled with adventure, connections, and hopefully some rest and relaxation in play. Subscribe and stay tuned for new episodes coming this fall. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.